Hello, everybody. Welcome to this panel session called Aging and Child-Friendly Cities and Communities. We have an exceptional panel. But uh, before I introduce our guest today, let me, let me remind you that uh, maybe this is one of the most relevant panels today because why 22% uh, of the global population is expected to be elder by 2050. That means older than 60 year old. So um, currently, myself, I'm in, I'm, I'm in a position where my parents are quite old and my children are still little, so I can feel and empathize with all this problematic. So how can elders live better, have better healthcare relationships, income and meaning? Those are questions that surround us every day. Since the Great Recession in 2008, decreasing incomes in middle classes, that also meant that a lot of people sent their children to be cared by elders. So that's another problem we face today. So both extremes of the population are meeting in one particular uh, important development of this society, which is creating better conditions for the development of our children. So we have two pos possible scenarios here. The first is we work less and spend more time with them, which seems unlikely. And the other is we create conditions for them to have higher quality of life. But there's another player which today will be also introduced, which is how new technological disruptions are influencing the lifestyle of elders and children. So uh, in the light of the fourth industrial revolution, this is a topic which uh, we not only have to face, but it is an opportunity for improving those challenges. So today we have with us Mr. Erion Belash, which is the mayor of the city of Tirana. We have Mr. Masashi Mori, mayor of the city of Toyama, and Dr. Joseph Ranzo Inada, chief resilience officer of the city of Toyama. We have Mr. Albert Izern, which is the CEO of Bismarck, a startup from Barcelona company uh, specialized on business intelligence and big data. And uh, last but not least, we have Professor Alberto Sanfoliu, which is the uh, full professor of comp computational sciences and also the head of mobile robotics and intelligence systems working at the CSIC and the UPC. So welcome to you all, and uh, I give the first word to the mayor of Toyama, Mr. Mori, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Masashi Mori, mayor of Toyama City. I want to thank the Smart City Expo staff for inviting me to speak. And I especially want to thank the FIRA Barcelona for hosting this conference. I'm honored to introduce you to some of the policies we have implemented and the positive results we have achieved to create a resilient and age-friendly compact city in Toyama. Our city is located about 250 kilometers northwest of Tokyo on the Sea of Japan. Toyama has a population of 422,000 and covers a large area of 1,242 square kilometers. As you can see in this slide, the city is surrounded by the 3,000 meter high crest of the Northern Japan Alps. We are the first Japanese city to be chosen for the Rockefeller 100 Resilient Cities program, and the World Bank chose us for a city partnership as the first non-national entity to ever sign an MOU with the World Bank. For these programs, we have identified potential shocks like flooding and earthquakes, as well as stresses like an aging infrastructure and uh, preventing environmental degradation. But perhaps our greatest challenge is a rapidly decreasing and aging population. It is estimated that one out of every three citizens in Toyama will be over 65 years old by 2030. To meet these challenges, in 2007, Toyama announced the goal of creating a sustainable compact future city, beginning with revitalizing our public transportation. 
Toyama's compact city policy is based on three pillars. One, revitalizing public transportation. Two, encouraging residents and business to relocate to zones along public transportation lines. And three, revitalizing the city center. By revitalizing public transportation, we are increasing the quality of life by reducing automobile dependency and giving the elderly more opportunity to remain active. And we are also increasing economic resilience by nurturing local businesses and attracting new businesses. Our key project for revitalizing public transportation is creating a 25 kilometer LRT network. This has four stages. In stage one, we built the first LRT line in Japan from the city center to the ocean front. This is marked in blue on the map. In the second stage, we constructed a new loop line in the city center. This is marked in red on the map. In the third stage, we rebuilt and elevated Toyama Station to create a transportation hub for LRT, trams, railroads, buses, and the Shinkansen or bullet train line from Tokyo. In the final stage, which is underway, we are planning to connect the LRT lines in the north to the rail lines in the south of the city. This is marked in green on the map. Toyama's Portram line, marked in blue, has had been an unpopular rail line suffering from a steady decrease in passengers and, and an inconvenient time schedule. We converted this rail line into the first complete L L L L LRT system in Japan and provided a more convenient schedule. This restructuring has been highly successful and there are now more than two times as many passengers on weekdays, and 3.6 times as many passengers on weekends. Moreover, the number of senior citizens using this new service in the daytime has doubled for those in the, their 50s, and increasing 3.5 times for those on their 60s and 70s. We had equal success with the city center LRT Centrum loop line. Here, female and elderly passenger ridership has especially increased sharply on weekdays. Together, the two LRT lines have made it possible for our senior citizens to go out more freely and more safely. Our LRT system has special features for seniors. Cars are all low floor for easy access. All tram stops have roofs and convenient benches and are barrier free for not only the elderly, but also people using wheelchairs. Um, board attendants help the elderly and LED bulletin boards tell waiting passengers when the next tram will arrive. Tram fares are low, 200 N, about 1.5 euros per ride. Both cash and smart cards can be used. And while passengers in Japan usually have to exit from the front door, passengers with smart cards can exit from the back. A unique project in Toyama City is the Odekake or outing commuting pass to encourage senior citizens to go out more. Citizens over age 65 can receive a 100M public transportation discount fare to the city center from any tram stop, railroad station, or bus stop in Toyama City. About 24.5% of the senior citizens now hold this special pass, including me. <laughs> and uh, over 2,700 people use it each day. The second pillar of our compact city strategy is encouraging citizens to relocate to the residence encouragement zones along public transportation lines, shown in red on this map. Citizens can receive a subsidy when the, they build or purchase housing or rental residence in these zones, and the companies which build high-quality houses may be subsidized. 
This map shows the population density in the city for those over 65 years old, with green the lightest and red the heaviest density. As you can see, elderly citizens are concentrated along the public transportation and residence encouragement zones. Therefore, as the next slides will show, we targeted the development of facilities for improving the quality of life for elderly citizens along these zones. The third pillar of our compact city strategy is revitalizing the city center. Because the city government has been consistent in carrying out our compact city strategy, this has encouraged private investment and the number of new commercial, residential, and museum buildings have been built in the city center core area. One key facility is pictured here, our award-winning all-weather multi-purpose grand plaza in the com commercial heart of downtown, which hosts 300 events a year. Another key facility across the street from Grand Plaza is our new grass art museum designed by Japan's famed architect Ken Okuma, a public-private partnership. The building also houses our municipal library and a private bank. As the largest grass art museum in Japan, the museum is home to a monumental installation by the American contemporary grass artist Dale Tifuri. Not only revitalizing transportation systems and building out uh, cultural facilities, but improving welfare services are crucial factors in making a city re resilient and uh, age-friendly. In another PPP, the Kadokawa Pre Preventative Care Center was opened in the city center at the former site of, of an elementary school one of Japan's first preventative care facilities, and the first using hot spring for hydrotherapy. The goal is to reduce the number of old, older people who need nursing care by improving their physical mobility. Another example of the value-enhancing impact of our compact city and welfare strategy is our new comprehensive care center in the downtown, where the medical needs of an ultra-aging society must be addressed. Through our PPP, we repurposed the form, former elementary school site for provide care for the elderly, but also for babies of working mothers and the handicapped and their family, families. Physician home calls are also provided so senior citizens can live downtown with a sense of medical convenience and security. This facility opened this April, and we aim to provide seamless services from newborns to the elderly. With careful land use planning, but convenient alert network and concentration of public facilities in the city, establishes a network of support services for senior citizens, for a safe and comfortable life. For many elderly citizens who do not drive cars, this LRT con connected network provides more opportunities for their outings and interactions. From an administrative point of view, our compact city strategy to create a society where elderly people can live safe and healthy lives, helps reduce social security expenses and contribute to making the city sustainable. Finally, our comprehensive compact city policies have produced a positive reinforced spiral effect, which is progressively creating our resilient and age-friendly city. As we revitalize public transportation, the convenience of public transportation increased. L ridership increased. Convenient public transportation brought new lifestyle opportunities to the elderly and to youth who cannot drive cars. These trends in turn interacted with downtown revitalization projects, 
bringing new private investment for commercial and residential buildings. This has brought about significant changes in our citizens' perceptions. A population shift to public transportation lines and residential zones has started. Now, people who used to rely on cars have fundamentally altered their means of transportation toward public transportation or bicycles. These trends, in turn, help sustain land prices, resulting in increased property tax revenue. Max tax revenue enables the city to invest in new projects to benefit citizens, and so on and so on as the positive spiral continues. We are still in the midst of creating a res resilient Toyama, but we can already see tangible res result. To create a truly resilient city, as a mayor, I must do my best with the broad participation of our stakeholders to encourage a positive upward spiral, which achieves a harmonious balance for future generations between quality of life and economic growth, and between environmental concerns and social values. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Well, and uh, now it's, it's you, uh, social exclusion uh, for elderly people is um, a main concern of cities. Uh, we had here a clear example on how facilitating transportation, and not only this, a very interesting idea on uh, how also to encourage special residential zones. One, one particular thing that uh, concerns the well-being of elders is poverty. And poverty is a main reason for exclusion. So now uh, Mr. Albert uh, Izen from Bismarck, uh, yes, uh, will speak, we'll speak about uh, vulnerability and how this uh, can be addressed uh, through his own experience as CEO of Bismarck. Please. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Welcome to Barcelona. My name is Albert Izern. And I want to tell you a, a story. Three years ago, my son was six months old, and I was rocking him for his daily colic. I was on my balcony looking at neighbors, and I noticed that a neighbor was following his cat with a torch. I thought, what a stupid game. The next evening, I was with my son again, and I saw the same neighbor with the torch. And the next evening, I saw again the same neighbor with the torch. Then I realized they have no electricity. I'm living in Barcelona, one of the best worldwide smart cities in the first world. And the poverty is closer than we can imagine. Thanks to big data, we can identify this vulnerable population in order to provide them the grants that the municipalities have for this purpose. Municipalities offer grants in a reactive way to people who apply for them. But there are a lot of old people who don't know they can access help, who don't know how they can access help, or maybe they are too embarrassed to ask. But for this challenge, we can collide with privacy laws Anyway, we can work with statistical information. We can work with aggregated information, providing highly valuable information to social services. Now, social services are asking for the budget subjectively. They are fighting with other departments and public agencies for the money. And he who shouts louder wins. Thanks to Bismarck predictive solutions, cities can plan the next year budgets. Big data allows us to change from a palliative approach to a preventive one. Thanks to big data, we will change the world. All this affects all kinds of poverty. Child poverty, fuel poverty, poverty is all the same things. All of you have poverty in your cities. How long are we going to accept this situation? How long are we going to accept this shame? This is hope. We can, we can, if we can start, if we start to implement 
these solutions. The solution is in your hands. I would like to say thank you to the Consorci de l'Administració Oberta de Catalunya, the Government of Catalonia, and the 80 municipalities that give, up, give us their data in social services in an anonymous way to help us to customize our predictive algorithms to identify this vulnerable population. Thanks to these algorithms, we can predict the future needs for different segments in the population in for location. Then with these predictive algorithms, we can plan the next year's budgets with this solution. We are reusing this data. We are enriching this solution with the portfolio social services and also with the budget information. This is the core of the solution, a little bit complex. We are reusing these social services files. We enrich this information with our predictive algorithms to profile the population for location. And also, we are applying the algorithms to predict this vulnerable situation. Let's see a, a demo of, with a sample of data. We are seeing in this report the potential needs, the social services needs for an universe of six, six million people, they just now, 600,000 users are just now using these social services. Based on our predictive algorithms, we identify that there are 700,000 potential users. Then our coverage, our real coverage, is about 77% of the people who need this kind of grants, this kind of help. And we can forecast the prediction in the future. Here we can see the pyramid age. We can realize that elderly ladies have a more expensive, expensive of lives. And here we can analyze for each territory a municipality level or more detailed level includes um, until a block level that privacy laws let us to arrive to a block level, we can identify these needs. Then we are playing with a tool for, to reach a 100% coverage for this sample of social services. And we can measure the budget, how it's changing, that we can block this budget also for the next years, and we can measure this to cover these needs for different locations. As we can see. Then, as I said, to solve this important pro pro problem, we have this kind of tools, we have big data, to stop this happening. The solution is in your hands. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Isern. It, it was very enlightening to see also how technology and through private companies are uh, precisely tapping into the needs of these uh, populations which are much in vulnerability. So thank you for your presentation. Now it's a time for Professor Alberto Sanfoliu. Uh, is a specialist on robotics, as you know, and uh, also art artificial intelligence. These are two of the main drivers who are transforming not only technology, but also our lifestyle. And the uh, implications that they are going to have in our future are huge, that we even can't imagine yet. So please, uh, Professor, hope we have more information from now on after your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Actually, I'm going to talk about that, about this new technology, robotics. And the point is how robotics can help in age and child-friendly cities and communities. This looks like that robotics is still a science fiction topic, but it is not. Actually, it has changed completely. 
but still the robots, when we see robots, we see robots in the factories. But the point is, which are the challenge that robotics can, can, be, uh, can, can be used for, for these communities? And in here I show some of these. Urban services, mobility, healthcare, good transportation, social activities, focus in the age and child people, most probably in aging people. That <clears throat> and then from this, what can can be robotics? Looks like look look in this um, in this slide, in the Eco Plus Plus project, that is a European project, where we were looking. Uh, topics that the robotics can can go in and provide some some kind of sources and solutions, and look that in the different the cities propose different challenges, and several of them are directly addressed to people. But look at specific ones, for example, mobility. Mobility. You can see here autonomous bus driving. That's a solution, and actually, it's a start to be uh, tested. Or co, co cars, that is another solution that is uh, tested. Or autonomous wheelchair for aging people, or some prototypes that are being uh, has been developed and are being tested with aging people to see if that provides something else. Or the other collaborative between people and robots that I will show now. Uh, for example, this is one example that is only a prototype. It's not a solution, actually. It's a prototype. Then an autonomous robot brings another robot to a place, and this robot can go and look for a, a person in a specific position and ask the person if it can help to transport, in this case, a suitcase, from one place to another. There is a kind of solution that in the future will be available. Will be available from many points, points that people can, will, will use this as a car for that to, to, to bring goods from the supermarket or for going to a, 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 <clears throat> another store to buy something or to provide some kind of services. This is this kind of the ro robots will be completely autonomous and will be used for people for bringing, in this case, ki kind of goods or whatever. There is one example, but we have more examples. For example, this is um, an example of the city, Yokohama, city in, in Japan. This is one of the centers, and you see how many people is moving. Can robots go in these places? and be aware of humans, don't bother them, and help to transport, guide, accompany, uh, do whatever on emergency situation. You can see on the top this full of people, crowded places. On the bottom, some, some of the robots that we use to do this kind of task and looking for algorithms that really be human aware and safe robot, makes our robots safe. They have to do very sophisticated uh, things to do that. But something else, for example, robots, if we have a robot, a typical function that we do when we walk around in a city is look for a person or look or accompany a person. This is, this, for example, a uh, test that we uh, has been doing in a place in the UPC uh, for looking for people and tracking and accompany. These are kind of issues that we will see not too far in the future. We saw in some science fiction uh, films, but actually we are doing this as a sp real experiment in urban areas. But we have more. That is, for example, another um, uh, research experiment in a supermarket in Japan, in Kenihara City. And that is for helping uh, a person to look for food and transport this food, accompanying, suggesting, uh, suggesting where is the place to go, where are the good uh, products, whatever, in really a supermarket. But we have more for th than, than that. We, can, we, uh, we have robots for helping aging and disabled people. This is for, for, uh, for feeding or for dressing. 
And that is a kind of robot that probably in the near future we will see in our own homes or in the hospital or in public places. That is a, a kind of a robot that are needed specifically for aging of disabled people or, or person that has reduced mobility. But more we can go. For example, that is an, a specific example that we still have not started uh, to work on, but we have uh, present for financing. That is uh, how to provide, uh, to solve some specific problems in aging people. That is healthcare monitoring or socialization or physical exercise. For example, robotics in this case can, can be a wheelchair, but a specific wheelchair that is autonomous, that can, uh, has uh, sensors, that when the person is sitting down uh, can recognize, what, can identify some biometric information, and, and also from healthcare information, and, from, and, and, and help the person, and coach the person, in this case the aging person, or the uh, not healthy person, uh, to, to do exercises or to do socialization and move from one place to another. And this is a kind of example that shows that actually robotics will be take care of people, will not bother people, it will help people to, to, be, to be going far, far away than uh, and now. And that is one of the, uh, the, there are many other examples in robotics, but that is only a few of them in order to show how robotics can help aging and child people. Okay, there is one example of this, um, or, or, figure, or pictures of this, for this advanced mobile coach in per personalized healthcare. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. The fact that robots uh, are already here is not a utopia, eh? but a real example. And uh, how to deal with them is a real issue. And cities here have a challenge on how to manage and integrate them as a society in our communities. At the other, at the other extreme, there are children. And uh, for children, you know, we have all here been educated under an educational paradigm where mostly the most important thing was to educate for having a job and making a living. But nowadays, with all those challenges, the, 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 ta the challenges that we have in the future for our children is how to develop them free, how to create and develop their natural talents, how to foster them. And for that, it's very important uh, to talk about uh, also uh, uh, childcare. We have here with us Mr. Erion Velay, the mayor of the city of Tirana in Albania, uh, to, to share also his experience on building a child-friendly city, please. I hope everybody is awake. It's always a challenge to speak between a, a long session and lunch. So any of you have been to Tirana, Albania? A couple. Great for you. The rest, no one is perfect. You can always make up and, uh, and come and visit. Uh, but the story is very, very short. Um, we heard a lot about what we do in modern places, in super smart cities like Barcelona. But what do you do in a place that 25 years ago was the North Korea of Europe? Albania was the most isolated country for about 50 years, and it only opened up in uh, 1991. So one of the ways to show that the country had moved to this casino capitalism and to renewed wealth and to prosperity, and we left the dark uh, communist days of poverty behind, was to get a car. So this was a city that in 1991 only had 20 cars. Today it has, 25 years later, 200,000 cars. In 1991, it only had 200,000 people. Now it has over a million people. And all of a sudden, our system of values changes. So, you know, we used to ask people, and we said, what is the most important thing in a lot of this focus group? And as many people in Eastern Europe, probably all over the world, would respond to be, the most important thing in my life are the children. And we said, well, if you put your money where your mouth is, and if children are really important, would you agree also that you spend most of your salary on your children? And people would say, of course. And then we said, well, let's do a little calculation. So we calculated that the average family, between the price of the car, the fuel, 
the insurance, the parking, the mechanic, actually was spending more on raising a metallic box called a car than actually a child. So we realized that in 25 years, our system of values had, um, had already changed. So we asked, how about we change things around? And instead of having the Balkans' largest roundabout, we start developing one of the largest pedestrian uh, spaces. Now, if cars had a personality, cars would like to be alone. You know, everybody who's been in a car, you'd no, want no traffic. But we don't run cities or we don't create cities for cars. We create cities for people. And if, because people have personalities, people like to be with other people. That's why the, re the reason we're not having a boring solo monologue is because we like to be with other people and share. So, but before we started this, changes, we had a big conversation about children. Two years ago, when we came to the city administration, the city was about almost bankrupt. So we said, well, where do we start first? And the average family conversation would be, even in those old communist days, when things were very tough and we were poor, we never spared anything on the children. So we said, well, as new city administrators, why don't we start from the nurseries and kindergarten? And once we fix those, we can move to other things. I also believe that children bring the best in people. So although the city was bankrupt, we said, what if we invite every company, every volunteer group, every NGO, and in a matter of weeks, we can refurbish over 60 or 70 kindergartens uh, in the city. It was a fantastic success. Now, in the beginning, a lot of the political advisors say, why do you worry about children? They don't vote, they don't pay taxes. You're a politician. You have to think about the next elections. We made a clear decision. We said, look, maybe it's about time within of the next generation rather than just the next election. And it really paid off. And it brought the best out of everyone because even corporations of people who are not used to giving, and people said, look, you, you've been in the West too much. People don't give philanthropy and all that stuff. Well, you never know until you know. And you find out by actually giving people the challenge to which the whole city uh, responded in a formidable way. And then we said, a city of a million people, what do, what do kids do? We have uh, adults, we know what they do, but what do kids do? Covered with concrete and thousands of, uh, of buildings during this transition period from communism to capitalism. And then we started to think, what if we build the largest playground uh, in the region? What if we build a place that is so much fun to get people outdoors? I think it's great that we're doing robotics and it's great to get people access to iPads and iPhones and smart things. But actually, you know, our intrinsic nature is to behave like a human being. You know, birds fly, fish swim, humans walk, run, climb, do things. So in the beginning, it was a big clash. And people said, not only he's changing our way of life, he's being a real communist, you know, he's trying to take our cars away and build all these pedestrian uh, places. But then we said, after many protests in building the largest playground in the region, we had a construction work that continued for 100 days. We had 78 protests from people who thought we were changing their way of life. I was supposed to give you some pictures of that, but we'll keep the ugly stuff out. But when we opened, it was the largest rally uh, we ever had seen in town, mostly by children. And then we started building these playgrounds everywhere. And for the most part, it serves as acupuncture. If a city is poor and cannot afford all kinds of uh, fancy robotics and you know, fancy transportation means, what you can do is acupuncture, which is the identical process that happens in, in physical acupuncture. Basically, a needle punctures a nerve and gets the whole body to tweak if you cannot do a full body massage or change a whole city uh, drastically for lack of finances and resources. And then we said, this issue of cars has, has gone a bit too far. Why don't we organize one day without cars when we shut down traffic for the whole uh, city? In the beginning, there was this wave of hysteria and parents complaining like crazy. They were saying, well, you know, he's taking our cars away. But we found out that kids loved it because everybody got their bike, everybody got rollerblades, roller skates. And then all of a sudden, the first time was a bit difficult. The second time was a bit easier. The third time, these kids had become radicals. 
they would scream and get their parents to get off the car, get them a bike, get them a rollerblade. And all of a sudden, this became a tradition until many parts of the city became a permanent place for children play. Now, a few remarks to conclude. There's this great uh, concept called an 880 city, uh, which was developed by this uh, amazing guy called Gil Peñalosa. And the concept is very easy. If all your urban planners, architects, engineers, uh, city workers were planning everything they did equally for an eight-year-old to access it and for an 80-year-old to access this indicative species, then we'd have an ideal city. Something similar has been developed by the Bernard Van Leer Foundation, which is called Urban 95. And 95 centimeters is the average height of a 10-year-old. So if every city was planned either with an 880 concept or an Urban 95 or the view of a child as they access space, we'd have much, much better cities. So children bring the best in people and bring the best out of communities. I think it's a great way to get politicians to think of the next generation and not only the next election. And I think they become some of the best advocates. Many politicians hire PR firms, communication companies. We found out that for a lot of these urban mini revolutions, having allies like children infiltrated in every family, whether it's about introducing uh, parking policies or whether it's about more pedestrian space or about the separation of waste, they are the type of electorate that has no strings attached, a solid sense of idealism, and also a fantastic sense of optimism. And therefore, uh, this is my two cents on why investing the children and designing cities with the mentality of a child is probably the best and most sustainable way to go forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor. It's been very inspirational to see also how a city can foster true leadership by building a different value system uh, and also listening to the hope of our generation, which is precisely our children. So now it's time for you, the audience. Uh, we have these four exceptional speakers. Uh, we open up uh, the, the floor for you to ask questions and reflections to any of one here present in the floor. So please feel free to ask. Who is going to be the first? You know that you have two options through the app, and also you can raise your hand, and we're going to bring you the microphone. There, uh, back there, please. Before you pose your question, please, if you can introduce just your name and your position. Uh, my name is Pablo Valerio. I work for Cities of the Future, which is a publication about smart cities. My question is for the mayor of Tirana. Last year, actually, we covered one of your uh, talks. And the, uh, I wanted to ask you about your mobility in your city. You talked about the, all these changes and introducing all these pedestrian spaces and the involvement of children, which is really something unique. Uh, as I've seen, and in great, uh, have people changed the, all the way of buying new cars? So they are, are you actually convincing you know, rich people to take the bus, as you said last year? Uh, I just wanted to know uh, like an update from your last year's talk. Thank you. <laughs> Should we take a few or uh, just go no, ahead? Please. Please. Thank you for following up. Actually, we, we went even further than last year. We've just introduced electric buses. The joke wa last year that uh, our friend is referring to is that, you know, what is the best decision for a mayor? Do you encourage every poor person to eventually make it and get a car? Or do you want to encourage also the rich people to go on a bus? Uh, so, uh, you know, once we started testing electrical buses and they all look fancy and now we're renewing our fleet, we're seeing more and more people uh, getting the bus. But people will not get the bus out of idealism alone. Uh, particularly rich people, posh people, people who are driving the big SUVs. You also have to make it a bit difficult. So in the beginning, we introduced, uh, we're talking to some of our 
uh, Telecom uh, Albania friends here, when we started to introduce the, the concept of paid parking. And people said, you know, this was such a great guy when he ran for office, then he becomes mayor, and now he charges for parking. Parking used to be free in this town. And I said, well, was it really free? Because we have 200,000 cars, but only 4,000 own surface parking spaces. So how was it free? Ah, it was free for the first 4,000 who got there early and left their car there for 16 hours. But for the rest of the 196,000 cars who kept circling around the city, adding traffic and fume and nerves and stress and horns and pollution, that was not free at all. So as a matter of fact, uh, money, other than optimism, is also another tool that gets people to rethink uh, the way they, uh, they do their transport. We are launching a, a massive uh, bike program. Uh, it's called MoBike. Some cities have it. Uh, but it's the dockless bikes. And sometimes you have to adapt smart technology also to the people's mentality. We're very, um, let's say we're, I wouldn't say chaotic. It's a great creative uh, chaos in the Balkans. So you have to respond to this creative chaos. If people are not Germans, used to putting the, their bike on the dock and behaving by the rules, but like to be a bit creative uh, with their haphazard behavior, then you find a tool which uses smart technology, like these uh, dockless bikes that you pretty much, they operate like the Uber, but you know now with a bike. So uh, the beginning, in two months, we will launch a few thousand of these bikes around the city. And at the moment, we're in the, putting a blitz cover of vertical signage for a lot of these uh, roads. Now, to get protected bike lanes. My sense is this, if you run a modern city in a rich country, let's say, let's call it the north, fine, you can do all the fancy stuff, and, but I think there's a lot of creative ways out there that with very inexpensive tools, uh, and also using smart ideas from the private sector, you can pretty much give the same service without spending an outrageous amount of money. So sometimes doing the fancy uh, bike lanes like in Amsterdam and Rotterdam is great, but if you cannot afford it, putting overnight thousands of vertical signage that can protect in a, uh, in a safe tunnel bikers from buses or dedicated uh, bus lanes, or nudging the private business to introduce more uh, e-chargers like we're doing, or um, electric cars. Um, you know, last year when I was giving the talk, uh, we didn't have any electric car. Now, just about every car dealer has now introduced uh, and offered the electric car simply because the city has made it more incentivizing. So I think the job is not to replace the invisible hand of the market, but I think to use the visible hand of the government to direct the invisible hand of the market. And I think the market responds when they find a smart idea that pays off. Thank you. Also, Dr. Renzo, you wanted to add some comments on it? This on? Ah. Uh, a couple quick comments. Before we separate, we haven't necessarily, children and aging. Um, the city of Toyama has a number of very interesting programs that are intergenerational. So you don't have, you're not trying to just deal with aging as one problem and children as a different kind of problem. And to pick up on this fabulous presentation, they're inexpensive programs. Um, the two that I think of is one that the mayor initiated, initiated where if you're a grandparent age person, and you take people of grandchild age, not necessarily your own grandchildren, to any of the um, facilities in the city, museums, uh, parks, and so on, you get in free. There's a free service. The second one that I think of, so it encourages intergenerational, helps the children, of course, and it keeps the aged mobile. The second one is we have a lot of programs where the grandparent age person and the grandchild age person get together in gardens and garden together, and there the elder person gets to use the wisdom of gardening, and the younger person gets to learn about the importance of growing and so on. So there are some non, not against technology, but some simple solutions, and I would say you really should think of aging and child. It's the 80-80, the 880 idea, not 80 versus 8 or something like that. Thank you very much. We have a we have a question by the app uh, to Albert, Mr. Isern, yes, which uh, says, "How did you create these predictive algorithms, and which reliability they have?" Um, our team have more than 15 years experience 
in provide these predictive algorithms to profile the population for private sector, for marketing campaigns. Our predictive algorithms identify different segments uh, of the market for location, for physical address, how old people who are living there is, how many children they have, income levels, levels of studies, how, how the home type, how old is the, is the building. We can predict the people who is living there and we are just now reusing the successful methodology coming from private sector for public sector for social services to identify them, to identify this vulnerable population. Then we have 15 years experience in a successful case providing this, the same of algorithms for private sector for marketing campaigns to personalize, to change from a massive marketing to a personalized marketing offering the product aligned with the target who are living there. Then we are, I'm really proud because before that we have, we used this, we used this experience to help our customers to increase their benefits, their incomes. And right now we are using the same methodology to, Im to improve the quality of life of citizens. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Uh, hi, uh, Jose, I'm very glad uh, I heard it's over, over here, uh, that uh, bridging between age and child, because uh, that was my first question. I'm uh, Iker, I'm, uh, uh, we're creating a, a town, a sustainable town, very child-friendly town in Valencia. It's a private initiative, over 60 acres. Um, and I was curious, because for us, it was born out of school, and as we were looking for the families, um, a great place to, uh, grow up and have their children play, uh, play again in the streets. I was, I was curious, Arion, uh, kind of your experiences in getting closer to the schools with the design of the uh, urban areas? Because we do see a lot of potential. I'm curious of kind of your experiences there. You made a hint on a photo with, uh, with that school, but I'm, I'm curious how you took that perspective from the schools into the city. One of the challenges we had is that when we came in the administration is that the city has, had grown fivefold, but social institutions like schools had not grown. And then we saw in Medellin, so, so the idea was, well, we need to keep up with the pace because otherwise kids were going in double shifts in the schools uh, with this increase of population. So clearly we have to build more schools and we have to find a project finance mechanism. We've built five, we're building another 20 now. But then we thought, but wait a minute, the school is a very precious piece of real estate in a very busy, in a very dense town. So we have to expropriate because no one thought of this in the 90s. So it comes with a very heavy price. And what for? To park kids for six hours? So clearly from a real estate perspective doesn't make sense. And clearly, you know, parents don't look at the school as a parking spot for kids for six hours. So we thought, why don't we build cathedrals? Why do we build schools? A cathedral for the community, um, if you're a Muslim like many in Albania, a mosque, whatever you want to call it but basically a big, large social institution. So we looked at Medellin and Mayor Fajardo, who's now running for president in Colombia, came up with a concept where he invited some of the best uh, architects in the world and he said, I want these schools that double as community centers, that work around the clock. So we took that idea with some adaptation and now we've invited some of the star architects uh, across Europe. Uh, you know, anyone from uh, Vinnie Mas from the Rotterdam uh, Market Hall to Rem Kolhas to Stefano Boeri of Bosco Verticale in uh, Milan, to uh, Bjarke Ingels, uh, famous BIG. So now they're designing these schools, and the idea is exactly that. If we're going to do this investment, might as well, you know, use it around the clock. And many of them are including sports facilities and community facilities, uh, preschool, child center, very fancy uh, sort of sports uh, events and surroundings. Um, and the idea is exactly that, to get the generations to spend time. A lot of these playgrounds, we started with this big fight when we built number one. We've built 27 now. So now it's a huge race to literally put these acupuncture needles all, all over the city. But it touches the nerve of the whole neighborhood because kids come to play, and then grannies come to knit, and then grandpas come to play domino, and then mothers come to do a little chit chat, and then men come to do business, so they've really become, if I may call it, a marketplace uh, for community exchange. 
so it is possible, and there's great examples out there where schools are not just learning infrastructure, but totally taking a different dimension when the learning and the teaching bit is only a slice of the, the usage of that real estate uh, property, which happens to be called a school, but like I said, could be a cathedral. Thank you. We'll take the last questions by, uh, by the iPad. Um, it is to Professor Sampaliu. Uh, I know that it, it is a question that would deserve more time, but uh, I ask you to be short, please. It is about when can we see robots really helping people? And which is the main conflict between robots and humans? Well, actually, actually, the, the, the first one, when we will see, we probably won't see to, be, to have robots immediately. We will see robots to, to, to be in a public pla places, in pro probably in a pr a public uh, buildings or in uh, supermarkets. That could be that is not going to be far away. Probably in the few years, we will start to see that. Uh, in museums, you can see already. In, in other controlled pl places, you can see that. More robots that help people in another situation in, in domestic, in the house, probably is not going to be far away. But in the streets, it's going to take some time because it's not only technology. You have to change laws. You have to change rules. You have to, you have to be aware of the culture of every country in every place. There are many things that have to be taken in account. And the, the, the second one was with respect to? Which is the real conflict between robots and humans. Who wins? <laughs> I mean, I mean, the, the the most important issue. If we want to, if we want to have robots close to us, is we have to. They they have to help us in some way, and they, they have not to disturb us, and and that is not so easy, because many many times people feels that it's always that that it's much better to talk with someone else, another person, than with a machine. But there are many other ways to do it. And I think who is going to win is always people, not robots. That's clear. But when we will have these robots that help us, that depends how well technology and laws and other things approach to humans. That is the, probably the most important question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all your presentations. Uh, we are coming into the end of the session, but let me uh, finish with some concluding remarks. Um, I would highlight three important messages of uh, today's session. The first one is that uh, we, we here have two approaches. One is policy-driven, and the other one is solutions-driven. And they both have three aspects in mind. One is long-term orientation when it comes to design policies or solutions. This is very important when uh, we are talking about people. And uh, sometimes the smart cities were born out of uh, technology providers who are providing solutions to cities to enable a technology, a technological progress and development. But now, the smart cities have more a meaning of uh, wise cities. Uh, wise cities really are built upon wisdom, and they take uh, a human-centric approach. And here it comes uh, the other aspect, which is very important, which is empathy. Brian Ways, a doctor uh, that worked with uh, elders uh, very close to death, uh, conducted a research, a wide research, and asked people that were almost to, uh, to die what were the two most important things that were worth living. And the research showed that first of all was relationship and second, meaning. So it's very important how we create the conditions uh, being technology-driven or policy-driven to precisely empower people, which is this year's Congress motto. So thank you very much. It's all in our hands. <laughs>